Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, on behalf of the Körber Stiftung, I would like to wa welcome you warmly to the Berlin Foreign B Policy Forum. There's already the 10th Berlin, f sorry, the 12th Berlin Foreign Policy Forum, and yet it is a premier. As for the first time, we're holding this forum in a hybrid form. I'm therefore very pleased about those who are participating digitally in our debates on German foreign policy today, and I'm particularly pleased to uh, finally be back in a well-filled hall with guests from all over the world. So, in flesh, completely analog, it's great to have you all here. So, the Berlin Foreign Policy 2022 is entitled The Price of Peace. That war has an unimaginably high price, is something we see every day following the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Thousands of people have died in Ukraine, not just soldiers, but also civilians. Some of them targeted victims of Russian war crimes. Ukrainians are paying the highest price for this senseless war. But also for those people in developing countries, the war has catastrophic consequences. So, compared to the suffering of the Ukrainian people and the fate of people in other parts of the world, the losses of prosperity we're suffering in Germany and Europe seem almost bearable. Nevertheless, who would have thought that we would ever have to deal with the scenarios of massive power cuts or even an industrial meltdown in Germany? But what is true for the war is also true for peace. Because peace also has its price. Perhaps it's not quite as obvious as the price of war, but peace cannot be had for free, definitely. Those who do not pay the price of peace, who do not invest in peace, will regret it later on and, in the worst case, pay with a loss of peace. Ladies and gentlemen, in Germany over the past 30 years after reunification, we have somewhat lost sight of this connection. Following the end of the Cold War, we concentrated more on reaping the peace dividend. We were a successful trading power and increased our prosperity. For defense and security, we invested only what was necessary, if at all. So, when it comes to energy, we believed ourselves to be deceptively secure and have become fatally dependent on Russia, despite the warnings of many, especially our friends in East Central Europe and despite the many opportunities to see how nefariously the Russian president is pursuing his goals, intervention in Syria with Assad, the annexation of Crimea and the increasing repression inside Russia are just a few examples. So for our policy of looking the other way, of not wanting to admit it, we're now paying a high price. The turn of the times is a real everything for peace. Mahatma Gandhi once said, I am a man of peace. I believe in peace, but I do not want peace at any cost. Of course, our goal must be to end the war in Ukraine and to stop the killing, but not at any cost. Not at the price of Ukraine's sovereignty and right to self-defense of Ukraine. A dictatorial peace can never be an acceptable peace and an aggressor must not be rewarded and encouraged to engage in further aggression. We must not pay such a price. Ladies and gentlemen, on the 27th of February, three days after the Russian attack, Chancellor Olaf Scholz announced the turn of the times. In our annual survey on the foreign policy attitudes of the Germans, we wanted to know whether the turn of the times had arrived in the people's minds. And the findings are at least ambivalent, if not sobering. So, just under half, uh, so that's 45% of Germans see the war in Ukraine as the greatest foreign policy challenge at present. But the share of those who would like to see German restraint in international crises and conflicts has even increased as compared to the previous year. And only a fifth of the Germans see a greater military threat in Russia. So these are truly remarkable findings on the backdrop of the war. So for many Germans it obviously seems turn of the times. What's that? 
And you'll find the results as every year in our publication, The Berlin Pots, online for download or on-site bound. Ladies and gentlemen, with this Berlin Foreign Policy Forum, we also want to make a contribution to ensuring that the fundamental upheavals in international politics are not only discussed in small circles of experts, but in a broader public. This means we not only want to debate with our guests here in the hall, but also involve all those who are following our live stream. So get involved, join the discussion, tell us what you think, and to do so, you can use hashtag hash Berlin Forum. Twelve years ago, in co cooperation with the Federal Foreign Office, we launched this Berlin Foreign Policy Forum. The occasion at the time was the 60th anniversary of the re-establishment of the Federal Foreign Office after the Second World War in 1951. Today, the forum has become the most important foreign policy conference in Berlin. And against the backdrop of the changing times, we need it more urgently than ever. I would like to take this opportunity to thank my colleagues from the Federal Foreign Office for their excellent cooperation. And now, I am very happy that uh, Federal Minister Annalena Baerbock uh, is going to open this uh, Berlin Foreign Policy Forum. And after that, Thomas, uh, Thomas Reinsler, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Estonia, uh, will speak. And because a part of my family comes from this uh, Baltic uh, country, I'm very happy indeed. So, Minister, Minister, welcome to you. And now, I would like you and uh, all of us a time of new findings, inspiring ideas, both on-site as well as virtually, so maybe we can fill the turn of the tide with ideas and life and find answers to the burning questions of our times. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Austin. Indeed, it is a pleasure to see so many of you here, familiar faces, old friends, but also new friends of Körber Stiftung, renowned experts of foreign policy. It is one of the aims of Körber Stiftung to deepen the debate on foreign policy, but also make it more accessible, include more in, in the discussions. We're therefore delighted that we have people here in, in this room, but also many watching us online, many virtual attendees, and also an international crowd. We counted and we have about 30 nationalities in this room, and if we count the virtual attendees, over 90. We want to engage in a discussion with all of you. Therefore, I want to stress what Mr. Palchin just said. Um, comment, ask questions on the attendee platform or via Twitter with the hashtag Berlin Forum. What is the price of peace? And what is the future of the European security order? These questions are at the heart of this conference day. We want to approach them from different angles, and we will have quite a broad spectrum of topics and areas that we will cover, from balance in the Pacific to relations across the Atlantic, new geopolitical roles from Germany to China, excuse me, taking stock of new developments, identifying opportunities, challenges, and lessons learned. However, we only have one day, and we're certainly not able to discuss everything. Um, so, for example, the, um, the many courageous people going to the streets uh, in Iran who are showing all of us what they're willing to pay for life and freedom and peace um, will be one of the topics um, that is not addressed in one, of the, in one of the agenda points. 
Those of you who know the forum know that's a wonderful tradition that the German foreign minister opens the conference day, and we're delighted that Minister Baerbock continues this tradition. She will come up here in just a minute. And we're equally honored and delighted that right afterwards, the foreign minister of Estonia, Omas Reinsalu, will give a keynote speech as well. With this, you have the floor, Minister. Good morning, dear Mr. Paulsen, Minister Reinsalu, dear Omas, dear Minister Haspa, dear Dominic, dear members of German Parliament, ladies and gentlemen. These dead boys and girls in Ukraine, that could have been us. That's what an 18 year old Estonian schoolgirl said. I met her in April in a secondary school in Tallinn. And these words were on my mind when three weeks later, on the 10th of May, I went to Butcher. That's a suburb of Kiev, a suburb similar to Berlin and Potsdam, Potsdam being the suburb where I live. These words were on my mind that could have been us, and that feeling touched me to the quick in Butcher. This is what the student from Tallinn had felt from the very first moment of the Russian brutal attack on Ukraine. To understand this, you need to keep in mind that she grew up differently uh, than 18 year olds in Berlin or Bochum or Braunschweig grew up in a different way. That young girl was born in 2004, that was the year when Estonia and nine other Central and Eastern European countries joined the European Union. After decades of division between the East and the West, this was a moment of happiness, a happiness in our common European history. And for us Germans, it seemed self-evident that this generation born into this new EU would grow up in prosperity, freedom and peace. From the perspective of many people, many young people from Eastern and Central Europe, however, 2004 was above all the year of a promise they were given. The promise, you are safe. For one thing, these countries are still grappling with the issues of oppression, deportation and dictatorship. The call for historical truth had mobilized people in the Baltic states before 1989. And after the end of the Cold War, it was finally possible to speak freely about these issues. And it was possible to develop remembrance and the scars of the crimes from the Soviet era are still present in the collective memory of the people and especially uh, in the collective memory also of young people. On the other hand, the perception of the threat posed by Russia in Central and Eastern Europe had never gone away. Even before 24th February, it was present. Your country, dear Omas, became the target of one of Europe's biggest cyber attacks as early as 2007. You know what it means when trolls try to divide an entire society. And if you look at the map, if you look at Lithuania, Lithuania, you would understand that there is this immediate feeling of threat. On the Suvalki Corridor, the only land connection between the Baltic states and the other NATO partners, there's a 65 kilometers of a bottleneck between Belarus and Russia. When I was in Lithuania in April this year, I understood when I looked at the ma map, you always get these beautiful maps when you're on the plane, and that was the moment where I understood what this sentence means. That could have been us. The horror of Russian tanks was and is 
within reach over there. It's so geographically close. Our eastern neighbors therefore share a deeply felt need for security. A security that we Germans have sometimes taken too much for granted after 1990. In die wir deswegen It's a security in which we have invested too little. The Peace Union of Europe, the security promise of 2004, for many of us it seemed so normal here in Germany. Our eastern neighbors understand what it means to be able to live in peace. And they understand you need to invest into capacities and capabilities, making it possible to live in peace. And that is why I understood that student, that schoolgirl from Tallinn, when she asked me a second question, she asked me, can we rely on Germany? It's a question I hear time and again, not only coming from school children from Eastern Europe. I also hear that same question from my Estonian and Polish, Polish colleagues. And I heard the same question when I met the 87-year-old Wanda Trajczykowska. I met her on the 3rd of October in Warsaw on the cemetery of uh, the graves of those who uh, had been in the uprising in 1944. She had survived the Warsaw uprising. She took to arms herself to stand up against the atrocities of the National Socialists. She asked me too, can we trust and rely on Germany? Can we trust that the Federal Republic of Germany will help our Ukrainian friends and neighbors who have to experience the very same things that I experienced in 1944. Even if the winter might get, uh, get, get hard, will Germans still support Ukraine? And I think uh, I have said it several times over the last few months. These are the questions that move me very deeply as foreign minister and also as a German citizen, as a mother, as a human being. And since I am foreign minister, I have responsibility to not just simply say yes when people ask me, can we trust Germany? I have to make sure that we create confidence that 18-year-olds later Ministers uh, of Foreign Affairs will no longer have to ask this very same question. And that is why I say very clearly, once again, what I said in Warsaw, what I said yesterday when we had the Foreign Ministers' Council meeting in Luxembourg. Yes, we stand by you. The security of the Baltic States, the security of Eastern Europe, is Germany's security. And when the going gets tough, we are going to defend every inch of our territory, of our alliance. And yes, we are going to support Ukraine with weapons for all it takes, because we do not just deliver weapons to Ukraine to save human lives. We also do that because we hope, and I hope, it will also create trust and solidarity. At the same time, I hope that younger generations from our countries are going to find it easier to show solidarity, because I think that many of you in recent months have talked about European security. We do that in Germany. People or children in the fourth grade say today, we are happy to uh, be in NATO. The grandmother might remember that back in 1980, she uh, took to the streets and demonstrated against armament, and she was not in favor of NATO. But this child and the grandmother share one feeling, a feeling that people in Central and Europe Europe have known for a long time, that our security is fragile, that peace 
must be protected is valuable and we can be grateful that we are in NATO and in particular in the European Union as a union of peace. The shocks to our security will shape German and European identity for decades to come and we are going to be active participants of that European identity. In this uh, context, it is interesting that the Kerber Foundation had conducted a uh, survey on German foreign policy, and even though many people, namely 52 percent, uh, in Germany would like to see Germany to play a more restrained role, but 74 percent of the Germans say that Bundeswehr, our armed forces, should be used to protect our allies. Today in this situation, it is most important to show cohesion. Most people in Europe and in Germany know that. It is all necessary to uh, show our greatest strength, our cohesion, solidarity with those who need our support, because solidarity is not an end in itself. It is the basis for our common security. This European solidarity is our life insurance. And therefore, this European solidarity is also the foundation of our common security policy for the future. This is what we laid down in our strategic concept for NATO at the Madrid summit. And this is what we also put at the center of our national security strategy. We, as the federal office, write that strategy on behalf of the federal government. The core of our security is the security of our lives, our freedom and our livelihoods. And that is why we are realigning our European and transatlantic defense capabilities. And here I'd like to say three things. First of all, we will continue to support Ukraine politically, economically, humanitarian support will be given and we are also going to deliver weapons, as I said, for Ukraine defends also Europe's freedom. And as you have uh, said, of course, the numbers, when we compare the month of February to the month of October, we hear many careless statements like saying it's, it's not necessary to have the absolute territorial integrity. We need to negotiate, we need to go for compromise so that finally we can have peace again. But here I say very clearly, of course it is necessary during these times to have controversial discussions because discussions is a strong feature of strong democracies and still I say very clearly such demands are naive and such naive strategies already failed in 2014. We've seen that the annexation of Crimea and the Donbas was only a prelude to what was happening in Ukraine, what has been happening in Ukraine ever since 24th of February. These, the, the Russian president says quite clearly he wants to have a total subjection of Ukraine. And when we look at the situation today, although during the last six, seven months, so many countries have done a lot in order to restore peace. They worked on it every day. They wanted this horror of the war to be stopped. And although half of the world has asked Putin to withdraw his troops, but still the Russian president is recruiting more and more troops. He doesn't recruit experts for negotiations. He's recruiting new soldiers in order to uh, attack Ukraine. And we see that these men oftentimes have to go into war, although they don't want to go there. These 
Russian tanks and soldiers do not bring peace to Ukraine. What they bring, especially in the east of Ukraine, is awful crimes, raped women, abducted children, killings of mayors who distribute bread to their population. And they kill even conductors who do not want to collaborate with the occupiers to make music with them. And that is why we will support Ukraine in their struggle to free their nation. As long as it is necessary, we will give support. And that is why I'm saying a peace dominated by one side is not peace for the people in the east of the Ukraine. And secondly, we equip our armed forces so it can be there to ensure the security of people in Tallinn, Riga, Vilnius or Warsaw whenever necessary. This also means that as part of uh, the European pillar of NATO, we must also better coordinate the European arms industries. At the moment, we have so many different models of transport vehicles within NATO and the EU that we are not even able to operate a common spare parts warehouse for them. Let me be quite clear. We should not consider armament projects primarily as national economic problems, but first and foremost, we must see such projects regarding armament as common security instruments, and this is what we are working on. And thirdly, we are permanently opposing Russia's aggression. President Putin has made it clear with a pseudo-referenda in the occupied territories that he is not looking for a way back. And therefore, for Europe, it is not about security with Putin's Russia. For Europe, it is about security from Putin's Russia. With our presence in Lithuania, we can deploy several thousand soldiers from our brigade to north, NATO's northeastern flank within 10 days. We also supply Eurofighters for air policing in Estonia and Slovakia. Yesterday, we were in Luxembourg together and we decided together to train 150,000 Ukrainian soldiers. We are going to do that in Poland and we are going to have uh, part of the headquarters located in Germany. This shows we stand by each other. We can rely on one another. And at the same time, as you have said, uh, it is Necessary to understand that we are in a hybrid war, in a competition, a confrontation between uh, the uh, free countries and authoritarian states. And that is why our cooperation uh, within NATO and the EU will mean we have to become more resi resilient together. We have to make sure that our infrastructure and our networks are better connected and better protected. The explosion of the pipelines show the vulnerability that we all have. And that is why, as a very first measure as NATO, we have to decided to do more to protect our maritime infrastructures, 100,000 kilometers of networks of pipelines, telecommunication networks, electricity networks, and railway lines. All of that needs to be protected. And uh, when we talk about security, we also have to understand you cannot guarantee 100% protection, protection of hundreds of thousands of kilometers of networks, 34,000 uh, railway kilometers in Germany alone. This is something you cannot monitor 24-7. But we can make sure that Wherever necessary, there will be monitoring and surveillance. And there should also be reporting chains, alarm chains, in order to intervene as quickly as possible. And uh, we have seen that successfully a couple of days ago. Nobody uh, was hurt. And German railways that uh, had an attack on their infrastructure could resume operations soon. But in the long run, we can 
only guarantee our freedom if we look beyond the boundaries of our conference. We also have to understand that there is a competition between democracies, between those who believe in international cooperation and international law. And this competition uh, is eminent between us as democracies and authoritarian states. And we must understand that this competition goes on also in other parts of the world. So we have to, first of all, learn from the failure of our Russia's, uh, Russia policy. Unilateral economic dependency makes us susceptible to blackmail. Uh, well, of course, when we look at Russia, uh, we can talk a long time about who made mistakes and who warned us. Our Eastern European friends have uh, warned us a long time. We didn't listen. But that's crying over spilled milk, and we should not repeat the same mistake once more. And we have to have this in mind when we look at our policy vis-à-vis -vis China. And that is why part of our national security strategy also means we have to formulate a German-China strategy embedded into the European-China strategy. And we have to also explain that everywhere where we do not act, everywhere we do not stand by our partners, we will have problems. And for me, that was one of the most important questions I received. Were were you when we needed you? We as European partners uh, defending the same values should also support others in other parts of the world. If we don't do that, uh, we are not fulfilling our pro promise and therefore we do not have left out security policy issues. So many countries of the world say the biggest danger for security is the climate crisis and that is why it is so important to tackle the climate crisis and help other countries in coming to terms with the climate crisis. It is a very important geopolitical issue and it is the security question for decades to come. Our message to our partners is the same one that we give to our European partners. We stand by you. We will extend fair and strong offers for you because we want to find common solutions. We would like to take into account the interests of all parties instead of creating new brutal dependencies. And that is why technical terms like global gateway are very important terms for our future cooperation. And I hope we are going to discuss this uh, in the course of today's conference day, because we need solidarity and cooperation. These are not ends in itself. Uh, we have the climate crisis. We need to fight it together. We need to also stand up against the nutrition crisis, the food crisis. We have to continue to be committed to international law. And this supports our partners, but this also protects our very own security interests. Ladies and gentlemen, the former Czech President Václav Havel once said, and here I quote him, I live where the word solidarity was able to shake an entire power block. It was the solidarity of the people who wanted to live in freedom and security at that time. They wanted to live in freedom and security instead of living under Soviet dictatorship. It was the solidarity of the people in Prague and Warsaw. It was the courage of the freedom movement in the Baltic states that made German reunification possible. Solidarity is Europe's answer to the brutal Russian war. Together, we are stronger than this war. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. Up Vielen next, Dank, Minister Reinsalo. The floor is yours. Herr Reinsalo, bitte als nächster. Sie haben das Wort. Dear colleagues, uh, 
sehr geehrte Kolleginnen Family und Kollegen, Kölber Stiftung, uh, Participants, Annalena, truly, thank you for this powerful message. Dank an die Frau Außenministerin für we know in Estonia we can rely on Annalena Berbrock. And uh, also, let me applaud to you personally on your message you delivered in United Nations General Assembly to all world nations, for the sake of peace. Die Sie im Interesse des Friedens gehalten haben. So, the question is truly not about also can we in Central and Eastern Europe uh, rely on Germany? Sure, we can and have been and will be. Definitiv. The question is wir, wir can Ukraine ist, rely Ukraine on West? Sich auf den Westen verlassen? How to end this war? How do we build a security environment that hinders future wars in Europe? And therefore, as Annalena, you stated that the security from the Putin regime. So let me refer it back. But there will, will be no security in Europe uh, if Putin regime Wenn will Putin be in future in power. In Zukunft an der Macht bleibt. And uh, let me remind the Putin's Und ultimatum. Ich darf This an das was not Putins erinnern. only about the uh, supremacy over Ukraine. Um It was about a right to rule um over Central Recht and Eastern Europe. Über und Without that, the basically the physical existence of NATO would be collapsed and also it would mean a collapse to the European Union because his demand was that no security uh, provisions will be delivered to these countries uh, which entered NATO after 1997. So, I truly agree that there is Zeitenwende taking place. Have we enough changed ourselves? Let, uh, let imagine this uh, devilish uh, vision that Putin would get control over Ukrainian territory in March. How would European security uh, look right now? You know, I w just days before the fall of this year, I, I walked with military, uh, Ukrainian military in, uh, in Crimean uh, bridge. And uh, they explained uh, when, uh, how they see the, the offense will start and what they uh, would do. But their message was that, yes, we know that the first wave we have to receive on our own. First wave we have to receive on our own was their message. And they uh, survived uh, with immense bravery. Now the question is, Überlebt. Jetzt uh, lautet die Frage, truly, that uh, what they have asked is not less hat, than truth, and Western courage to defend the truth. Den Mut des Westens, Just days after the, in the beginning of March, I rented a car Anfang and uh, went to Ukraine. Auto and I spent all the months in the spring uh, offensive, uh, about a week in Ukraine. I met the same people, I met with other people in front lines, generals, uh, ordinary people, business people, politicians, political leaders. And so this was their own pledge. Please give us a true message and act by that. The first thing of truth, I do believe, is uh, what has reached to our backbone, uh, that we have, the Western family, has miscalculated Russian strategic goals. We have taken these as a certain uh, isolated set of offensive acts or uh, manipulations, whether they are, they are terror acts, 
political uh, uh, economic corruption, influenced elections, disinformation, or uh, military uh, attacks, or, uh, however, proxy uh, attacks to our uh, legitimate, democratic legitimate uh, uh, principles all over the globe. It, was, it has been a targeted, systematic, strategic approach to get superiority over West. And this claim is still vital. Putin has not basically to read his concepts hidden its strategic aim seine Konzepte nicht verändert and uh, their aim to get Und superiority over us Ziel is not by uh, taking actions uh, by launching nuclear war but by fair indifference tiredness, our tiredness economic attraction uh, and mental and intellectual relativism and secondly, the basis of truth is indeed a true assessment of the situation which takes place uh, in this uh, uh, aggression war of Russia against Ukraine. And this is a legal judgment. Russian war of aggression against Ukraine is genocide. And again, we have to admit uh, Putin has not made any secrecy, Putin and his uh, near ideologists. Methods of annihilation of Ukrainian statehood and Ukrainian nation uh, that are used to reach those goals are defined uh, fully responding to the Articles of Genocide Prevention Convention. Yes, there has been some uh, uh, approaches that to declare this war as a genocidal type of war would mean escalation because the Convention of Genocide Prevention ends with the article that all parties have to take steps to prevent genocide. So this is not uh, uh, accidental that this, is, has, uh, this has not found uh, a wide uh, a legal concept support political support in Western community. But I think it is not the right way. So uh, Estonia was the first country uh, on the earth that stated that the Russian war against Ukraine is among other horrors also a genocidal uh, war. I drafted uh, that uh, declaration and it was based on a large family of international humanitarian law academicians uh, analyzes, also a previous international law practice analyzes, and also in a vast list of uh, witnesses statements. And we have seen that all these steps of uh, atrocities take place also in the near past, unfortunately, fulfill under these articles of this convention. Secondly, uh, untruth is indeed about the uh, arms deliverers. I truly applaud uh, to the Germany for this recent decision of delivery of Irish T air defense systems. This was a, uh, I know we are having a tectonical, paradigmatical uh, changes uh, uh, in, in in countries taking place, but this was a clear message, and I'm so proud that already days after political decision, it has been, it is already in practice, in practical use, and uh, this is something uh, uh, Germany should be proud uh, of. Because what it means, it means basically we all uh, know the painting of Guernica. This is against Guernica. The, this is the most humane step to defend children, women, hospitals, kindergartens. You know, on 1st of September, 300,000 small kids went uh, uh, to Ukrainian schools. 
One third of them uh, were not taking physically part in classes because of threat. Schoolmasters, local uh, uh, municipal leaders have to take a decision whether there, if there's an air siren going on, whether there uh, can children with a master, class master run to the shelter or not. So this is a truly brave action. But also there have been a set of myths about arms deliveries uh, in Western camp, which uh, are the, like um, spectres rising. Um, the first, uh, if you remember from the march in the Western family, this one myth was that delivering heavy weaponry would mean nuclear winter, that uh, Russia would escalate it to that uh, level. Well, it uh, mm, appeared to be not true. The second myth was Russian, uh, Ukrainian uh, military are uh, unable to use sophisticated Western weapon systems. It is also not the case. The most complicated uh, Western weapon systems are fighter jets. And for Ukrainian pilot, it takes about maximum three months uh, to have also capability to fly with uh, F fighters if they will just get these fighters. So there is not any uh, excuse in that matter. And the third myth is indeed that we, uh, in a combined way, Western community, is out of stockpiles, as of ammunition and as of also this type of heavy weaponry, what Ukrainian friends uh, are asking. And this, we have to admit, is also untrue. Uh, we have still vast capabilities to deliver, first, and secondly, uh, there is also uh, several caveats, uh, political caveats to put on this armament, and I think what is uh, uh, most important that there should be no any caveats on conventional weapon uh, delivery to Ukraine. And also, uh, the truth is have we done collectively enough? Well, war is a very expensive thing. One thing is about humanistic approach. The second thing is about uh, expense of uh, ammunition and weapon systems. We in Estonia have calculated the price uh, in a day when Russia attacks. Usually it's about uh, 100 million, it, it, we are, uh, calculate 100 million euros uh, a, a day. Now looking also to Ukraine in repurchase price le level, so basically they are losing hundreds of millions of euros, Ukrainian friends are losing a day. So put all combined together, all these uh, uh, very positive steps that we have delivered arms, hundreds of millions, billions, but we are speaking hundreds of millions of day need. This is a perspective. United States uh, uh, calculated by think tanks uh, a measurement that uh, Operation of Afghanistan costed two trillions. Two trillions Afghanistan, solely for United States. One, it means one hundred billions per year. Has have we reached to the altitude in the uh, to give our arms delivery to Ukraine uh, uh, in that basis to the same altitude? The answer was negative. So what, what I make a pledge is immediately to raise uh, the capabilities of European peace facility. It's running out of uh, resources. Its per, per perspective is seven years. It's how now we have used in the, during the uh, eight months already uh, two-thirds of that. So uh, it is not the perspective about uh, some billions. It's a perspective should be about at least 50 billion euros to that perspective. And, uh, Another thing is indeed, if we are speaking about the Zeitenwende, is sanctions. We have not to the altitude which is needed uh, that the war would step. What was the aim of sanctions? It is a punishment. Uh, the disciplinary measure, disciplinary measure in international relations that uh, subject of sanctions will in future do such kind of acts? No. 
it is a uh, pressure, uh, pressure uh, aiming to end the war, because the only person who can not right now end the war is Putin. And as we have not reached to that decision point, it means the sanctions have not reached to the needed altitude. Uh, remember mm, the Munich Security Conference, it was uh, this stage of war started uh, 20, uh, night of 24th. The Munich was 19th, 20th. What President Zelensky said, the war, zero phase of war started already. Our intelligence of, uh, operatives, everybody told it. What Zelensky said, please do uh, 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 preventive sanctions. Please do preventive sanctions. And was, what, what was our Western Com European Union uh, response to this uh, on Tuesday when Monday evening Putin uh, declared that uh, he will recognize our Lugansk and Donetsk uh, republics? The Federal Council members were sanctioned to enter European Union and also the products of Lugansk and Donetsk were sanctioned. Not enough, unfortunately. So basically what I want to say, in Estonia we do have the same cutting the tail of dog by slices. It's a very painful to dog uh, and probably also cutter. Uh, but what we want to do, if our aim is in a near future, to a nearest future, and this is a human, core humanistic uh, point of gravity should be of our actions, to end the war. So we have immediately raised the altitude of sanctions because cutting the tail of the dog is not the way actually. It's going to be more painful and more time demanding to our customers, to our companies, uh, and what is most important to the lives of people in Ukraine. And more weapons, more uh, weapon systems, and the third element, continuing isolation of Russian Federation. And now we see some kind of reconsista in, in international sports organizations. Well, it's another info operation of uh, Russia, what they are doing by their operatives, uh, who are trying by money, uh, taking control in international sport organizations. There's nothing to do with sports. This is something to do with genocide and uh, uh, trying to make us uh, in an optic of illusional entrapment. And surely we have in the sta all states level, in the all countries level, to condemn it. And finally, I think the truth is also about responsibility. There should be, and I think all the free nations in the world understand it, no return to the business with Putin regime. And this clear guarantee of that is establishment of international tribunal on aggression crime. We do have international criminal court, which competences do fall the war crimes on the ground, but not the crime of aggression, mother of these crimes of humanity, a decision-making of starting the aggression war. And this is out of competence of ICC. It should be a set of policy of European Union creation of such tribunal of uh, bringing these who are responsible into responsibility. So, this war is not about Ukraine solely. This war is about us, who we are. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Reinsanur, Minister Baerbock, for these powerful statements. They were powerful at the same time ex extensive, so we only have a few more minutes for Q&A, but we still would like to, yes, please join us here. Thank you. Come back to Thank you. So let me just address you with, with um, a question each, and I ask you to, to answer as, as brief as possible. Um, 
I'll start out with you, also Minister Baerbock. Um, you mentioned the Berlin Pulse and that 52% of the German population favor a restraint when facing international crises. Also, 68% uh, say that Germany should not take on a military leadership role in Europe. At the same time, our international partners in Europe and across the Atlantic would wish for a different role of Germany. How to bridge that gap? Well, first of all, I think it shows perfectly how complex uh, foreign policy and also security policy uh, is, that there's not black and white and yes and no uh, answers, because, and I have to look where are my notes on this, you were mentioning uh, the 60-something percent who said we shouldn't take a leadership uh, role uh, with regard to military action, but the opposite or the other side of the answer wouldn't be to take no role at all. But if you ask me if Germany should be the military leading role, I don't know if I would say openly yes. I would definitely hesitate to this question here because all I'm calling for in my speeches is to say we as the European Union together have to be able to defend ourselves together. And yes, obviously Germany is the biggest and strongest uh, industrial country within the European Union obviously has to play a central role, but therefore I'm always a bit uh, reluctant with these numbers, but you're right, also 55% say that we should restrain internationally, but what I mentioned already, 74% uh, say that we should um, be more involvingly when we should uh, defend our uh, partners and allies, 60% think Germany should increase spending on defense, 67% think Germany should reduce economic dependencies on China. So to bring this all together, I think the call from uh, many people in Germany is to engage, to always consider what uh, the consequences of engagement are, but also, and I don't do the mistake again of saying an English uh, sentence which could be read um, uh, differently, but I think for politicians it's always the most important task to argument for their belief, to argument for the beliefs of the European Union together and don't look at weekly poll numbers and think uh, this is the course we have to follow, but uh, to really uh, see where we have to stand together as Europeans together and I think there are also the numbers of uh, German society very clear. They say we believe in the European Union and we believe in the European common security interest. Thank you, Minister. I have a number from the Berlin Pulse for you as well, Minister Renfalu. 68% of the German population are a little strong or very strongly concerned and afraid of a nuclear strike of Russia. I heard that in a, in a recent Fox News interview, you said that we should not be frightened. So what would be your message with regard to that? What were these poll numbers during cold war time? And uh, do they mean that being afraid and every person surely uh, takes very seriously nuclear, nuclear attack threat, that uh, nuclear power threats in such a way as we actually do not remember uh, from the uh, even Stalin didn't use uh, uh, rhetorics of threats in his formal speeches, uh, speaking uh, very abstractly about the peace and defense of peace. And so, uh, of course, uh, this is a serious thing. But another thing is there is a set of rules of nuclear deterrence. A nuclear deterrence says that if you use the nuclear weapons, there the price tag will be. Uh, Whatever, me, by a, whatever means uh, so high that it does not make use to use nuclear weapons. And so if we say that uh, because of being afraid in this con conventional war of Russia using nuclear weapons, it just gives leverage to Russia, and I think the crocodile has enough appetite to use such rhetorics, either in Baltic direction, either in southern direction, wherever uh, Russian uh, nuclear uh, plane or submarine can reach out then. Thank you. Thank you. I see on my screen three 
3 minutes 47. So I have time for, I guess, one quick question from the audience. Stephen Erlinger, you were the first one with your hand up. Please be brief and address the question to no, the ministers. Thank you, Steve Erlinger, New York Times. The same poll, Ms. Baerbock, says that only 22% of Germans see Russia as a military threat. How do you explain that, please? Well, first of all, I'm a politician <laughs> and no psychologist, uh, but uh, what I see uh, on the streets is obviously that people are afraid of war. And I think this is just a human feeling. I mean, who is not afraid that the worst thing in life uh, could happen uh, to you that your kids, your beloved ones, will be killed. So therefore, I'm always a bit careful with polls. The most important threat, I mean, if you ask people, and many of you know also how interviews are being done, if you ask what is the most important uh, or the most uh, dangerous threat you're just thinking of, and your mother is just dying of cancer, I don't know if your answer comes up uh, to the head, but this is why I said I'm a politician and I did, haven't done uh, this poll, so I, I don't know if it has been asked on the security level or not, so you shouldn't think of your uh, mother uh, dying because of cancer. But being more serious on this uh, question, but I think you can see my my uh, reluctance with regard uh, to, to, to polls, um, is that obviously, yes, we always, and this is the job of politicians, we always have to argue every day for our fundamental values, for our democracy. Democracy as peace doesn't fall from the sky. We have to fight for democracy every day and this is the main job of democratic parties and this is why I always uh, go not only uh, to classes uh, in the Baltic states but also here in my own country try at, uh, as much as my calendar leaves uh, room for me to go to school classes to go to our Verbraucherzentrale where people go when they cannot uh, pay their electricity bills or they have some complaints uh, with companies here to hear what people are saying and this was also very interesting for me, and this is not an official poll, but this is what the people who are working there and speaking from the morning till the afternoon with people to say, well, I have an electricity bill and I don't know how to, to pay it. They said, most of them, they don't have anger, but they have fear. So our task as politicians is to take away this fear, and with regard to the uh, energy prices, this is way more easy than with regard to uh, the horrible situation for the people people in Ukraine. We can build up a 200 billion package to um, stop the explosion of the energy prices to help not only the people, but uh, to counter the hybrid warfare of splitting our societies also social-wise. So my answer to your question is good policy with regard to security policy and helping and defending Ukraine, but also good social protection for the winter, not only in Germany, Germany, but in the whole European Union. Thank you very much, Minister Baerbock, Minister Reinsalou, for joining us this morning, for giving us lots of food for thought for the upcoming discussions. Thank you very much. While my colleagues in the back here help us set everything up, uh, I am delighted that we can now continue the discussion we just started with the ministers with a stellar panel. It will be moderated by Antje Pieper. Antje Pieper is the deputy head of the ZDF politics desk. Antje, I ask you and your wonderful panel to stage, please. Thank you. You can sit wherever you want, I guess. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Yeah, the price of peace, rethinking security of Germany and Europe. We already heard this introduction here. Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Ukraine changed everything. Um, 
ended the post-Cold World area and our notion of having overcome war in Europe. German government changed its policies, creating expectation in whole Europe and the world, the New York Times, <laughs> is watching on what's happening and how united Europe will be. Um, what are the lessons we learned? Which price are we prepared to pay for living in peace? Um, we already heard Minister Baerbock saying security is fragile. Uh, how will we react? And I'm very um, grateful to discuss this with my guest here on the panel. I will start on the left with Zarancha Gonzalez. She's former Minister of Foreign Affairs, now Dean of the Paris uh, Affairs of Spain, <laughs> of course, now Dean of the Paris School of International Affairs. Thank you very much for being here. We have from Ukraine Yulia Osmolovska, Executive Director and Member of the Board of the Eastern Europe Security Institute in Kiev. We have from Norway Ine Eriksen Sorede, from the Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs and Defense and former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Norway. And we have the Minister of Defense of the Republic of Latvia, Lettland Artis Pabrix. Thank you very much for being here. And before we start the discussion, uh, we would like to have some um, statements in the beginning, so you can make your points <laughs> straight away. And we will start with our Ukrainian guest, Yulia Osmolovska. Thank you very much, uh, thank you very much, uh, distinguished audience, and uh, let me give uh, my kind words of appreciation to Kerber Stifting for the given opportunity to speak to you and to address to you today. And definitely it uh, would be very, um, uh, very valuable actually to reflect to some of the remarks that uh, the distinguished ministers made in the introductory speech because uh, Ukraine has a lot uh, to say on that issue and uh, really we'll be very glad then to continue in discussions. But uh, first of all, getting back to the issue of uh, Zeitungwende, definitely as a former diplomat I see these titanic ch changes that are happening right now in the EU on the European level and uh, within Germany itself with regard to the support of uh, Ukraine. And uh, a quintessence for me uh, in this regard was um, the uh, joint communique of the J7, which actually is uh, uh, currently chaired by Germany. And uh, the Federal Chancellor Scholz was the first one who called our pr uh, president uh, after these uh, uh, desperate attacks uh, that uh, Russians launched in Kiev on 10th of uh, October. And then this statement, uh, G7 statement, was extremely strong in sentence. So uh, in my all years of diplomatic experience, I haven't experienced this kind of uh, strong language being expressed by the European leaders. So definitely uh, we, we acknowledge this very much, especially those who are involved in politics or diplomatic uh, um, staff or experts level. We do understand and appreciate it, but probably not on the level of the general audience, uh, the Ukrainian public. So definitely we welcome to the recent decision of Germany to provide Ukraine with this uh, RST system, uh, but the general expectations of Ukraine are uh, still, we want to see the, the uh, Western partners more actively involved in, in, uh, um, in supporting Ukraine. So definitely getting back, we see this Titan and, uh, and it's very symbolic that we'll be talking about uh, uh, NATO approach, a changed vision. Uh, it's very symbolic that right now the uh, exercises on nuclear deterrence are happening uh, within NATO countries uh, and also all these decisions with UNIP uh, weaponry um, they are quite welcomed, but um, I think that these changes in perception of threats, uh, uh, the uh, level of engagement of European and NATO members and uh, support in Ukraine should be actually matching the dynamic and intensity of the conflict as such, because we are currently not in local uh, regional conflict of uh, low intensity, it's high intensity war. This is why we spend a lot of munition every day. 
This is why it's very difficult for West to respond adequately with the speed of that. So it means that uh, I was a bit um, uh, frustrated with the recent findings of the Kiel uh, Institute of World Economy, who actually does a very sort of sur survey of what had been promised to Ukraine, what Ukraine asked for, and what had been actually delivered. So there were one study uh, in August, the other one was in October, and the dynamic of uh, uh, narrowing this gap of what had been promised and delivered uh, is not there. So this is very sad to see. And especially on the stuff that Ukrainian asked about heavy weaponry, like tanks, uh, hot pizzas, and MLRA system. The ratio the Kiel University gives us is 10% uh, of NATO uh, stop available, actually, uh, not 10, sorry, 2% two, two of actually available stock of NATO countries uh, that were provided to, to Ukraine, 4% for Hovitzers and 4%, uh, 3% uh, of the Melera system. So this is a very disappointing amount. I do understand that we could uh, either look into whether it's political uh, challenges and complications for that. Uh, from the words of uh, the German minister, we saw that this is not the case. So then we need to look into whether it's probably physical incapacity to deliver somehow. Or a third reason might be uh, bureaucratic uh, challenges uh, to provide the swift delivery. So uh, the call is here. Uh, why Ukraine is so uh, energetically ask the West to keep up the pace? Because uh, with the Globsec Security Institute, we've conducted a study on different scenarios, how the situation might develop till the end of 2023. And actually, the key factor which determines the dynamic of the situation will be the performance of Ukraine on the battlefield. But this is closely linked not just to military support of the uh, European investment partners in general, but also to the macro-financial stability support, which you actually provide at amazing uh, generosity. Uh, so because of that, we are able to sustain economically right now what, what's happening in Ukraine. But definitely in our common interest to have this uh, war finished as soon as possible. And Ukraine have all these military capabilities to do this in terms of trained personnel, personnel which is being trained right now in Western countries also, uh, um, filling out these ranks. Uh, but also we need this kind of speedy delivery of weapons because uh, in this case we could um, defeat Russia um, in the very near future. And uh, this would be resource consuming, actually. Not resource consuming, it will be resource saving. And uh, it won't lead to European fatigue of European population with regard to the war. We do understand that your public uh, has a sort of detachment from the problem. And uh, we do understand why it's happening. Because your politicians, they do understand all these risks. But on the level of general public, believe me, from personal experience, when we heard this uh, Georgian war. We were sympathetic to Georgians, but we haven't understood actually what it was about unless we saw these missiles just pouring on the streets in Kiev and exploding. So this is why it's rather theoretical perception here about the war in Ukraine. But on the level of politicians, it's very appreciated, it's very acknowledged by Ukrainians, and we would like also to close the, this gap with the public. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Mr. Pebris, what is the Latvian point of view? <laughs> well, I don't know what the Latvian point of view, but I can definitely say my. And, uh, you know, I have been uh, in the last half a year uh, quite critical of the German policies. I must say in the last weeks I have been softening myself a little bit regarding this. But um, to start with uh, trying to answer your, I would say, philosophical question, uh, what price are we ready to pay for the peace? I would... Uh, rather redirect this question, what price are we ready to pay for our freedom? That is a highly important question, because if we do remember uh, our ancestors in, for instance, the Second World War, it was not just a price for peace, it was a price for something which was taken away from us. And uh, I think uh, I very much agree, of course, what my colleague Reinsel was telling in the previous speech, but uh, if you are looking uh, to what is happening with our society during the Russian attack on Ukraine, the Russian war, 
uh, against Ukraine. We must see, first of all, how we have been um, progressing within the last seven months, what have been our mistakes before the 24th of February, and uh, where are we going, and what will happen with us as a Western nations, as European Union, as a NATO, and also, of course, our relationship with Russia. If I'm looking to uh, the situation before the 24th of February, I would say it was a huge blindness. Uh, in the Western societies. And if you ask me a Latin perspective, I would say that we have been frequently charged with uh, assessments that, you know, those troublemakers at the Baltic Sea, they are telling about the Russians the bad stuff and because the life has changed and life is beautiful and everywhere is a peace. And unfortunately, we have been right because the West has not taken into account anything what happened in Russia in 2008 with the attack to Georgia, 2014 attack on Crimea and later on with Donbass and etc. And once we had these famous quotes and sentences in the Western society about let's not escalate, then the only thing what escalated was actually the weakness, because what escalates in Russian eyes is the weakness of the West, and we have been producing a weakness during the decades, and which made Putin and Russians to think in a false uh, perspective that if they press more, we will simply step back. And now we are standing with our back to the wall and we have nowhere to go back anymore. We have been making the same mistakes also uh, after the night of 24th of February because remember those debates, uh, what happened in the first days. There have been a number of people telling, uh, look, you know, Ukraine, including even German generals, telling, okay, Ukraine will lose in a few days and we will be back in a in a state before and we have to readjust. We had these enormous phone calls which made, as you asked, Latvian position and opinion uh, to Moscow, phone calls from Germany, phone calls from France, trying to accommodate, trying to find a compromise. Compromise with your freedom? or compromise with your consciousness, or what type of compromise, or compromise on the, let's say, expense of poor Ukrainians, which are now dying while we are talking. Now, if you look to the Latin perspective, we have been managing to send the stocks of our fingers day before the Russian attack on 24th of February, and our Latvian stingers actually assisted that Hostomel airport was not taken by Russian paratroopers because our stingers killed them. And that was a positive deliverance. But remember the discussions just after the 24th of February, telling that should we provide Ukraine with offensive weapons? I personally, as a Minister of Defense and Vice Prime Minister, I would say I actually don't understand this discussion about offensive and defensive weapons which were within the first month. I mean, what is offensive and what is defensive? Every weapon is killing in the hands of a soldier or a killer. Now, and then, if you do not give, for instance, a weapon which can reach a Russian territory, so what happens if Ukrainians uh, approach the border with Russia? You, will you take away their handguns because they can shoot across the border? I mean, this was a totally insane discussion which actually produced the situation where the deliveries of weapons to Ukraine actually was happening too slow, too weak, and if we would give at the very beginning or before the war, that assistance which Ukraine needed, and military assistance, humanitarian assistance, economic assistance, that war would be over. We would have to pay already much smaller price for freedom or, if you wish to, for peace. Now, if we speak about contributions, of course, Minister Reinsel was, uh, was very much uh, prizing the German deliveries of of air defense systems and others. And I was yesterday looking actually to the German deliveries. So as far as official sources uh, claim, military deliveries, I don't speak about humanitarian parts because we are all part of that. But uh, up to now, it seems like Germans were delivering 30 Gepard systems, about uh, 53 uh, M113 uh, military vehicles, then some 10 or 20 Hovitzers, big ones, you know, 2000 and etc. Now, all together, the German uh, military 
aid to Ukraine during the war uh, is counted approximately 800 million euros. 800 million euros. Now remember what was told about the Afghanistan war and just uh, a small, uh, small. Um, how to say, a sidestep or a sweetener, the Latvian military aid of my country, which is less than 2 million, was actually more than 300 million euros. So, I mean, are we doing everything? Are we paying the price for that peace or freedom, what we should pay? Now, the Russian aggressor state has a GDP of maximum 3% of the world. The Western, the free West, military, assist, uh, military or, sorry, economic might is about 50%. So if we would put all the economic assistance behind Ukraine, which is fighting a war for us, for our freedom, for our values, which we claim always in European Union and other places, this war would be over. This war, we must understand, this war is already happening now here. We are living in the wartime economy. Now, are we ready to do this or are we not ready to do this? Because what Russians are hoping, they are simply hoping that the Western society has become, because of the peace and good life, so uh, vulnerable and so without resilience that by hitting economy, by hitting our psychology economy with gas prices and energy, psychology with threatening all the time with nuclear war, that simply we will step back and we will give up. If we do give up at this moment, then it will be the encouragement for the next war, which already will be really on the European and on the NATO soil. So actually, the question, and I will finish with this because I think we need a, a plausible discussion, the question is very simple. Are we ready to stand for the principle that might is not right, or we are not? Are we really just paying a lip service? that we are a value system based liberal democracy or are we are ready to defend and stand for this? And this is a question not to Ukrainians, or not to Russians and not to us. This is actually to the West. Can we rely on each other? Can we rely on the Western principles? Because this war is changing also the internal setup of Europe. Because look, you like it or not, but actually a lot of activity and a lot of decision making now because of the deeds and not worse is moving now from the Western Europe and even Central Europe to the East and Northern Europe, which is Nordic countries, Baltic countries and Poland. And if I have to say the last words about what will happen after this war, what we will win, what Ukraine will win, because there is no alternative, then believe me, uh, the Baltic the Baltic Sea area, the Northern Europe, will claim also its share in the future of shaping European Union and future of European continent. Because we have been the ones which have been paying with everything for this war for Ukraine to stand for. And I really believe that Ukraine will be the next EU member country, and I would say also the next NATO member country, because they paid with the blood for that. And Europe without Ukraine will not be any more Europe uh, after this war will be won. Thank you. The Baltic Sea was very clear, always from the beginning, or before the war already. Ms. <laughs> um, Gonzalez, you just told me before that um, now you're not anymore the, the um, Minister of Foreign Affairs, you're now at the academic view. You can, can speak more openly. <laughs> so what's, um, what's your point? So, uh, not only can I speak more openly, but maybe I can take a bit of altitude uh, and think a bit long term because uh, essentially what we see is uh, a change in the world uh, that the EU has been living up until recently, uh, with the world becoming, the EU's world becoming a more hostile place. And changing uh, from the environment we were living before, more hostile certainly on the security side, with uh, the return of war to our territory, the return of territorial wars, colonial wars that we thought belong uh, to a different century, and with the weaponization of energy, which we also thought uh, belonged to a different century. 
it's also becoming hostile on the economic side. As we focus on Russia, there is also China on the other side of the world. Uh, China, whose economy is moving more to the left, where state intervention is becoming greater and where the expectations uh, would be a slowdown in this economy that uh, has powered uh, a lot of uh, the economic uh, growth uh, around the world. More hostile also internally in our democracies, in that our democracies are moving also to more extreme nationalist positions, something that to resolve and to decide what the EU uh, should look like in the future matters a lot, because as we uh, just heard from Annalena Baerbock, uh, we want uh, to remain democracies, but a democracy that works on extreme nationalism is a bit of a difficult democracy to make work. So so I think what we are facing, what the EU, Euro, EU and what Europe beyond the EU is facing is a fundamental choice. Do we want to follow a world that has become more hostile or do we want uh, to have a say in how the world uh, looks like in the future? Do we uh, want to remain a specific model, which is what we are, a specific model combining uh, progress, solidarity and democracy, or will we want uh, to change that in the future? Now, my sense, or at least my answer, uh, it's an academic answer, so bear with me, uh, is that uh, the EU should remain a global power with as its own specificities, a responsible and respected global power. Now, for us to remain a responsible and respected global power, we have to make a few investments. Let me uh, briefly outline uh, what I see as three big investments we need to make. We need to make, and, and frankly, this question for Europe is the question for Germany too, because at the end of the day, uh, Germany is a big, uh, the big powerhouse uh, in the EU. So as the EU responds, Germany has to also answer part of this question. So in my view, we want to remain a responsible and respected global power, which is what the EU is. Then we have to invest more in the EU. It's not enough to invest nationally. We have to invest as EU more, res more responsibly on security, more responsibly on defense, more responsibly on industrial capacities. Some call it a strategic autonomy, for those that don't like the term uh, because it is charged, call it the EU being responsible for its own future. And we have to do this moving in unity, and that's sometimes, uh, as we heard, it is difficult, but the value uh, for the EU is moving together in unity, not some moving forward and another lagging behind, but moving in unity and that takes time and it's tough. The second, uh, in my view, on our to-do list is for Europe, not just the EU, but for Europe to also organize itself faced with this more hostile world. We saw this in Prague recently with this European political community um, and it's, in my view, an interesting way for Europe to take its responsibility. The EU is part of Europe and we know this, uh, Ine is here, she uh, represents Norway in this discussion. There are countries in the EU who do not want to belong to the European Union but still want uh, to represent this more geopolitical Europe. Now, of course, uh, this doesn't mean that the EU should stop its process of enlarging. There are also countries in Europe who want to be members of the European Union including Ukraine, uh, which means that we will have to open uh, seriously this avenue too, as uh, we've been doing recently. Finally, I don't believe in a world where it's the West against the rest. For the EU and for Europe to be responsible and respected, we have to engage with the rest of the world.
and not just on our terms, but being also uh, clear about the priorities, the motives and the aspirations of other countries out there, which to me speaks for the European uh, family also being more attentive to multilateralism. I know this is not very fashionable, but this is the beauty of being an academic, is that you can tell uh, not fashionable stuff in the hope uh, that someone will pick it up. So, Andre, back to you. <laughs> this is all right, eh? um, what are the European principles being challenged by the war at the NATO's border? Well, I think it's, um, for the sake of discussion, important to remember or to try to talk about what we are up against and what we will face in the coming weeks and months. If we go back to Putin's speech in Munich in 2007, he was very clear on the fact that he saw uh, the dissolution of the Soviet Union not only as a catastrophe, but also as a great humiliation. And that is what lies behind what is happening right now and what has been happening for the past, um, well, 14 years, and I'll get back to that very shortly. So the idea or the notion that this is all about uh, not wanting NATO to expand or to be enlarged, this is really not the case. This is about history. This is not about NATO. And this is about a president, a totalitarian regime, who is only looking backwards in history and never looking into the future, because everything is about history. And that is also why I think that the uh, lack of Western response to the attack on Georgia in 2008 actually enabled the annexation of Crimea in 2014. And not only enabled, but the fact that we were not able to do more than, to a certain extent, sanctions uh, after 2014, having more or less the same cooperation with Russia, with some exceptions. Uh, I mean that that also enabled uh, the attack that came, or the renewed attack that came uh, on Ukraine on 24th of February. Uh, and I think it's important to look in parallel at what was happening in NATO and the Western world alongside these events. Uh, I remember well being a fresh defense minister in October 2013. And I was at my first NATO ministerial. Uh, there was a special guest, the Russian defense minister. Um, and this was at a time three years into the strategic concept of 2010, where Russia was seen as a strategic partner in the strategic concept. There were certain NATO countries who actually meant that over time, Russia could become a NATO member because things were moving in the so-called right direction. Um, I remember well that my next defense ministerial in the spring of 2014 took place exactly at the same time as the annexation of Crimea. And I'm telling that story just to remind ourselves how we have been dealing with Russia um, over time. I think we have been plagued with a lot of wishful thinking. We have been thinking that if we just engaged Russia enough, they would be like us. Uh, they wouldn't be, and they are not. Um, and I think some of the lessons I learned both as a defense minister and as a foreign minister was very parallel to the story I told you about Georgia and, um, and, uh, and also uh, the annexation of Crimea. In every meeting you have with a Russian minister, you have to be very, very mindful of what is being said. And you have to answer and push back everything you disagree on. Otherwise, Russian, uh, the Russian minister will take it as an acceptance and come back years later. In Alice. Well, um, I actually, this week is not only the famous with, con uh, with your conference, but also with Riga conference. And if I recall correctly, in uh, 2010, 
in Riga conference, I was telling that we want a German boots on the ground. And that was a big uproar at that time of how would you imagine, you know, German boots, we will never do this, this is something horrible, the Germans and military, no, no, no. So, of course, um, it was even for me a little bit of surprise when um, your Chancellor Scholz announced this uh, huge uh, um, uh, readiness to pay for the Bundeswehr, for the military, etc. But uh, I still, uh, of course, uh, look uh, for the reality what Germany will be capable to deliver. Because I think the German society after the Second World War, and this is our opinion from outside, was so much pacified and seen also only as an economic power that now it's extremely difficult to grasp for large segments of German society that you have to change. We want that Germany is a military power. And uh, I might uh, respectfully disagree with Madame Baerbock, which I consider actually looking from outside as a, as a spearhead of this Zeitenwende, because she is the one which is the most popular in the Baltic countries and in Latvia. But uh, I would disagree that still Germans are looking to all this military security and defense part only uh, by um, hindering that through the European Union. No, 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 let's be serious. European Union is a good thing, it's an important thing, but we first of all want to see what Germans can do. Because once we need a military action, once we need a defense action, we cannot and we will never speak in foreseeable future about, for instance, European military. Only people who are not experts can talk about that. So that means very much will depend on the military might of your country, of Germany. And your military might, sorry, actually is not there. It's not there. It's not corresponding your economic might. We need a Germany to be a much stronger country. And then, of course, European Union can be used as a restraint for Germany. But the European Union cannot be used as an encouragement for German military. It doesn't work like that simply. We just heard um, the foreign minister of Estonia saying, um, have we enough changed ourselves? Did we already change ourselves? You are on the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can answer whenever, no? I, but I, I saw I have a question here on my iPad. Um, if you have a question, then I will follow you. Okay, I have you. But um, I have one which is very good here on my iPad. I say, how long will Europe's support for Ukraine last with growing popular discontent and the threat of right-wing populist winning elections again, like in Italy? I can start. Uh, well, that, that is really one of my big concerns because when uh, German politicians, uh, as I've heard them over the past months, talking about the real risk of social unrest due to uh, energy prices, interest rates, inflation, and so forth, um, it is, of course, something that uh, will be just tuned up by, by Putin and used as a way of diminishing the support. And that is why I think as responsible politicians, even though some of us are out of uh, ministries and, and offices now, but still in, in politics, we have to be very open to people about uh, what this is. Um, and I think we have to prepare people for the fact that for the first time, I think in, in as long as anyone here can remember, this is also a crisis where we cannot simply buy ourselves out of it. I mean, right. the pandemic was, in a way, um, something we could buy ourselves out of. The only issue was to invest enough in vaccines and purchasing vaccines. And we knew that there was a silver lining. We, we knew that it would, take, uh, it would take some time, but we would get to the end. The fact that all of the reasons I mentioned with why Putin is showing such brutality and aggression towards Ukraine, that is not something that can be mended by economic cushions. I mean, we can help out our populations as much as we can, but in the end, this is the question of values. This is two systems colliding, and we are definitely going to have to take the fight alongside Ukraine for those values that actually forms and shapes our societies and has made us what we are. Um, Ms. Osmolovska, um, uh, are you afraid that the longer the war will last, 
the less support there will be because you know there's the gas prices are rising, everybody's complaining and um, is afraid of, of the bill. Yes, we, we are definitely aware of this fact and actually when we were doing the security uh, uh, we've been following the changes of public opinion in uh, European Union with regard to support Ukraine, support the sanctions. And uh, so far it has been more or less stable, so not draft, uh, drastic declines in this uh, range in between 60 and 80 percent of European population supporting actually uh, the actions. But definitely we understand that because I said that it's rather perceived as a, something very distant, theoretical. So your people are not seeing all these missiles flying over the streets and exploding in the city center. So therefore, I think that the level of tolerance to this uh, would be decreasing over the winter. And this is why we are pressing very much that uh, it is in common interest to finish this as soon as possible and Ukraine is capable to do it provided we have all the requested uh, military equipment we wanted to uh, in order for this only season, uh, winter season of 22-23 will be the most challenging one. And this is also would be uh, very uh, really, uh, relievable uh, to, to the European politicians to, to express to their public so that you need to stay strong, be brave as Ukraine for at least one season, so it's not going to last longer. And the longer the, the war goes, because there are still risks of this protracted conflict, and our uh, general-in-chief of the army actually explicitly said this in his article, that there is a huge risk, and this is the high probability scenario for this war to, to, uh, to, to get into a protracted one. And then all of us will be losing because European insecurity will be fixed for indefinite time. Unless the matter is finished, you can't actually learn uh, how to behave, how to act so then, uh, with the, coexist with aggressive Russia. So we need to, to finish the matter first and uh, to see a different Russia. So this, this is my answer. Thank you. Okay. Can I uh, adjust? Uh, I mean, of course, uh, it's not uh, a question just uh, of financing, although the financing will go a long way in ensuring that those that are at the lower level of our societies don't feel an exacerbated pain. And that needs to be resolved at the European level, because this also has to do with the energy union, and that will work if we do it at the EU level. But beyond that, there is a thing that we need to work on more for the long term, and this is making sure that all European citizens share their nightmares. Their nightmares today are different because they are shaped by their history. Mm. A person in Spain doesn't have the same nightmares that a person sitting in Estonia. And it's normal. By the way, the person in Estonia doesn't share also the sense of insecurity that someone sitting in Spain or Portugal has which is driven by its own history, by its own geography, uh, and that is also something we have to invest on, making sure that the European citizens share their nightmares as much as they can, because that is how you build a common sense of the threats and therefore a common sense of the responses that Europe, Europe uh, can give to all their citizens. But at the moment this is not the case, and, and we shouldn't be surprised by this. I now open for the audience. You've been the first. Maybe you introduce yourself. Thank you. My name is Katie Chumbadze. I'm deputy head of Mission of Georgia to the European Union. Um, Georgia was a couple of times mentioned here. Uh, and uh, indeed, in 2008, Russia's aggression uh, in Georgia was the first test uh, towards the resolve of the European Union and uh, the entire West. Um, it's indeed very that um, peace has its uh, price, but we all are paying this price because we still are in the responsive mode. In 2008, we were in the responsive mood. In 2014, we were still there while uh, Crimea was annexed. Uh, when uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia were occupied in 2008. And even today, we still continue to be stuck in this responsive mode. 
My question would be to distinguished panelists, uh, distinguished ministers from Latvia and Norway. So how Germany and uh, the European Union can shift this responsive mood to the proactive policy in a way that there is less price to be paid for uh, peace? And what would be the perspective of further enlargement and uh, Georgia's or Ukraine's uh, membership in the European Union in that regard? Thank you. Well, I'll try to be brief if I can. Look, uh, of course, perception of threat is different in uh, Western Europe or Western Western Europe, for instance, compared to the Baltic countries or Nordic countries, because if this perception of threat would be there, then Finland and Sweden would not j um, exchange their traditional policy and join now NATO. But uh, I once more would like to remind, and I think this is what we have to tell to our public and our people, yes, gas prices might rise, yes, uh, social life might get more difficult, but we must understand that we are living in the wartime economy, mm -hmm. all of us. And if we are not winning this war, then the next war might be the last war for us. That we also must understand. And people must forget, uh, okay, people can't forget about this, but, but people must understand that uh, their traditional worries or economic uh, benefits what they are getting must be put aside as a second priority because the first priority is really now to prove that you can stand for, for these values which we were always claiming on the paper and vocally but we were not actually never testing them. Now it's a testing time are we really ready for this? And once you mentioned, for instance, about, uh, about this uh, danger, of right uh, danger of right wing populism, let's be honest. I mean, in Western Europe, uh, it's not only right wing populism, but also left wing populism, which is equally dangerous if we are looking to the, uh, this war situation and attitude towards Russia because there are left and right-wing parties actually equally supportive uh, for some kind of consensus on not their expense with Russia just to end this. So uh, uh, I think there is no other way as simply to consolidate our population and tell this will not be over easy. We are with our backs at the wall. But as far as the Georgian membership in the EU and uh, further on, uh, I think, uh, unfortunately, it's now a diff different discussion, but I think that Ukraine now is much further uh, uh, than you are because of also uh, certain internal discourses and political uh, choices you have been making in Georgia, and you know what I'm talking about. I have a question here in this room. Thomas Lannebrocker with the German Marshall Fund with a question to Minister Soraide. Uh, Norway has been incredibly helpful with energy uh, supplies to Europe in this uh, difficult situation. It has also made enormous profits from, uh, from that situation. So my question to you is, what is Norway willing to invest if, into eventually uh, Ukrainian reconstruction? And a quick question to Mr. Pavlix. Now, the critique of German foreign policy is as justified as, is, as it has become a cottage industry and a sport. You have been a real athlete in this discipline over the past month. And you've said that you have tempered your critique. If this was a tempered critique that we have heard, I'd be very interested in what it is that you didn't say and why. You want to answer directly? <laughs> <laughs> well, what I didn't say, you see, uh, of course, I, I, I'm, I'm a politician, and, and I, uh, in some way, I was telling also my German counterparts that uh, don't get upset to me because I'm simply uh, expressing what my people think of Germany. And uh, actually, 
at this moment, and I can tell this to you, uh, at this moment, um, there are many analysts and general public in Latvia or in the Baltic countries very genuinely thinking if there will be a crisis or immediately when we will need this and not in a five months or six months because for us the Russian threat differently from you and differently from Spain, Portugal or France or Italy is of fundamental existence. This is why we are now spending for defense three percent almost. It's a plan for us. We are introducing compulsory military service. We are introducing a total defense system because once we see what happens in Bucha what we see what happens in Mariupolis. This is nothing new for us. This is what they did to us when they occupied us after the Second World War. They were raping, they were doing all the, all the things what you could imagine, and you were not talking as a German society here after Russian invasion in Second World War for obvious reasons. But we know why, what happened, and we are determined that this will never again happen on our soil, which means we must be ready to defend the first centimeter of our country, of our border. And I'm speaking here also about Estonia or Lithuania or Poland. We are not taking chances just to hear the uh, words that we will assist you, everything will be fine, etc. No, we are not going to risk. And this is not just, just the words. We who experienced the Soviet regime, we who experienced the Russian invasions and abuses of our parents and grandparents, we are ready to die for our country and to die for our children. Are you ready to die? That's a question. And Germans must answer this question. Are you ready to die for freedom? We are doing, ready to do this. And this is not what, this is serious. This is what also Annalena Baerbock said, that she is always asked first, can we rely on you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the first question was yes. for you. <laughs> I didn't forget. A bit of a, a steep move to, to energy from, from life and death, death yeah. issues. But, but still, I'll, I'll try as best as I can to answer your question. Uh, Norway is now, of course, the most important and the biggest provider of gas to, to Europe. And I have to say that I think now uh, there is a strong realization in Norway that energy policy is also security policy. That has not always been the case because we have never used energy as a security policy tool, but others do. <laughs> uh, and that is why we have to realize that. And I remember back uh, in 2014, after the annexation of Crimea, I asked my security policy department in the, for in the defense ministry, to give me an assessment of how Russia was then using energy as a tool, at that point isolated more or less to Ukraine, but turning on and off the switch. Uh, and it was a lot of enthusiasm in the defense ministry. It was not that much enthusiasm in other ministries uh, at that time, because there was a bit of a reluctance to see this as, an, as a security policy tool. Uh, you are right that the uh, income uh, has of course increased a lot uh, because we sell more uh, energy and, and the shortage makes the prices higher. That is not uh, conducive to Norway either because it makes a huge imbalance in the energy market, which of course is not good for anyone. And, and no one is served by the prices that is seen right now. And I cannot, of course, speak for the current government after the change of government, but I can say this much. Uh, so far, there has been full political uh, unanimous support to uh, everything from reconstruction funds to uh, arms uh, donations, aside, of course, from, from um, one party in parliament, the Communist Party, who would not like to send uh, arms and weapons. Uh, but otherwise, there has been support. What what the number will be in the future is, of course, um, very difficult for me to say, and, and the government will have to answer that. But I can, again, say that from, from our side, from the opposition side, there is a strong, strong push to the government to do everything we can, both on the financial side and weapons, and also the political support that is needed. Uh, this is, of course, nothing that we can do alone, but I 
think it is extremely important that Norway also leads the way in, in having these discussions on everything from defense spending to reconstruction of Ukraine, uh, and also what, what happens in 10 years' time. Uh, how, can, how can we try to assure that we will not end up in this situation again, either in Ukraine or in any other country uh, in Europe? So that's part of the discussion, and of course the government will have to come back to the details um, when, they are, um, when they have shaped them. But it is a strong political support in Norway for all kinds of support to, to Ukraine. My suspicion is it will last and it will even get stronger. So I already heard a sound, but I know there's a lot of questions. Can we have a quick one here? Very quick. Short question, short answer. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Michal Baranowski, GMF Warsaw. Um, one observ no, um, no observations. Um, question to you, Minister, and perhaps to uh, Ms. Osmolovska. Um, we are discussing here whether side of Venda is real. Uh, what would it take in a short term, let's say the next three, four months that are crucial for Ukraine, for you to say side of Venda is real, and for you, Minister, to say the same perhaps over a longer term? When could you trust, as you say, Germany or Germans that they have in fact switched enough in a direction to understand the Russian threat. Thanks. Uh, okay, first Ukraine and second, let's say, Germany or us, yeah? Well, I think uh, with Ukraine probably there is a very uh, conventional answer from my side. We simply must do everything we can to provide them with everything they need without any hindrances. Plus, of course, we have to give a clear signal to Russians, and they will see this publicly, that we will not step back. Very simple. They understand the force. They are not stupid. Yes, they have a certain problems of maneuvering themselves, you know, in their heads, but there is no other way. Ukraine must win. We must provide Ukrainians with everything they need. Simple. Everything. Humanitarian, economic, and, of course, definitely military, first of all. Uh, and remember winter, so Russians are hitting now infrastructure, they hope that Ukrainians will freeze. They will not freeze, they will survive, they have a motivation. As far as us in, uh, in Europe and Germany, well, um, I think that uh, we simply must move forward not only, and I, I mean, I'm a politician, I understand how these things work basically, but uh, we must uh, also in our minds to divide what we talk and what we really do. For instance, there are a number of things. First of all, what we have to do is uh, to move forward as soon as possible with European uh, Union education mission in Poland. As far as my latest information is, uh, Germany is still blocking this because they want part of that mission to be also in Germany. I don't know why, but I think we simply must, must go with Polish case. Latvia is ready to participate. Um, the next thing is about, for instance, our uh, military stocks and military industry. Let's uh, do step by step and do real things and not just dream about European army or something. And once I hear, for instance, about this uh, old talks, uh, which is old, old, long time already on, on the scene, about uh, different uh, military equipment, uh, which should be kind of consolidated. I would say yes, but looking from my country's perspective, what we are doing now, we are developing our own military industry because we learn from the COVID crisis that we cannot rely on deliveries, we cannot rely on the global networks because simply they are not working. So we need also our military industry, for instance, ammunition, repairments, etc. If I hear some larger European countries, including Germany, telling that we will unify air defense systems, we will unify this. If that means that we would have to buy all the time everything only from Germans or French or Italians, this is not going to work. There must be also a production lines and industrial cooperation with smaller countries. And this is a, a totally different talk, but military industry, believe me, is the one I have been working now for four years drastically. And, and, and big countries must take this into account, uh, how we think about that. I will stop with that.
Mrs. Osmolovska, I'm short. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what's crucial for, for the coming two, uh, two three months? Uh, you can see uh, developments on the battlefield that the Ukrainian side is trying to get as much as possible to regain the control of the territory of Ukraine. And we hear some encouraging signs about Kherson and Kherson region to, to, to see these positive developments, hopefully in the next couple of weeks or even, even faster, because you see how the company um, uh, military campaign in Kharkov region have developed uh, drastically just in a couple of days. Uh, uh, Ukrainians retook uh, quite a big part of uh, the territory. So uh, positive assessments that Ukrainians uh, with this intense of uh, counteroffensive, provided they have means for that, uh, Ukrainian can uh, regain the control of all the territories prior uh, 24th of February, even by the end of this year, or even go further. But then we come again to this uh, immediate needs for Ukraine. I mentioned to you this uh, very disappointed, disappointing proportion. So Ukraine asked for heavy artillery to be able to do this counteroffensive, scaled counteroffensive, entire front. And 2% of NATO uh, tank stocks, stockpiles, 4% of NATO holbitzer stockpiles, and 3% uh, of MLRS systems. So it's a miserable bond. And we, if, when I mentioned that there is big discrepancy about what Ukraine requested, been promised and been delivered, so still the gap is, uh, our military people told in summer that the gap was around 10%, um, uh, only 10% of Ukrainian needs were covered. Right now, now we're talking about roughly 30-40% of what Ukraine's requested so far, but it's still not sufficient. So therefore my plea to all of you would be to consider whether there is a room to change the dynamics of these deliveries, because it's in our common interests. We can make this war short, as short as possible with your assistance. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, um, time is over. Um, thank you very much for discussing with us. Um, a lot. It's not about peace. It's about freedom. <laughs> you corrected me. <laughs> and thank um, you. yeah, thank you very much for discussing and uh, giving back for also for your question. Giving back to Alisa the word. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, you're, yeah. Thank you very much.